Cyrano de Bergerac by Edmund Rostand, Act 5, Part 2. All right, we thought that Cyrano was practically dead, according to Ragonel. So this is news to us as the reader, and Roxanne has no clue because she didn't hear what Ragano said to Le Bray. But in, in enters Cyrano. And Cyrano now has this little plume. Remember, he would have a feather in his cap, a white plume. So I added that here. Uh, so he comes in, and he looks like he's suffering a bit. Um, he's pale, and he doesn't look very well. He's wearing his hat, which hides his wound. But he talks happily to Roxanne. And he does tell her very solemnly that he has to leave at nightfall. They talk about the the falling leaves that would fall on her sewing work. So she starts doing some needlework while she's sitting out there. And then she protests and says, please don't leave at nightfall. And she reminds Cyrano, you have to tease the nuns. You can't go until you give them a hard time. They love that. And then um, Sister Martha comes and he teases her and says, well, you can pray for me at night vespers, which is prayer, um, evening prayer. Vespers is evening prayer. And Cyrano gives, so, so, he, he's been wounded, so Roxanne doesn't know, and they're having this conversation. And he gives this comical report, so he's her gazette, remember, basically her newspaper, he gives this comical report of the news of the court. And his face becomes more and more tortured, because he's in pain. He had a big log that fell on his head. And then he finally loses consciousness. But Roxanne runs to his side, and when he comes to, he tells her that the injury is an old wound, not from anything recent. And she holds her heart and says, we all have our old wounds, referring to the pain she's feeling from losing Christian. Cyrano asks about Christian's letter. He says, oh, you still have that letter, right? And remember, I always wanted to read it. Would you let me read it? She says, well, it's stained with blood and tears, so it's difficult to read, and I've had it all these years. But yeah, you can read it. Yes. She gives him the letter, and he begins to read what he wrote so many years ago. Cyrano's reading this letter that he wrote so many years ago, and Roxanne is amazed by the voice with which Cyrano is reading this letter. And she's dreamily thinking, wow, this is an amazing voice. And then Roxanne says, as I remember hearing this voice long ago, and she comes closer to Cyrano. Remember, it's getting dark now. Twilight is setting in, and so now it's darker. And Cyrano's reading the letter, and she looks over her shoulder and says, how can you read now? It is dark. And then he starts, turns, and sees her there close to him. A little movement of surprise, almost a fear, and then he bows his head. A long pause. Then in the twilight, now completely fallen, so now it's too dark for him to be able to read it. Somehow he has it memorized. I don't know. She says very softly, clasping her hands, In all these 14 years, he has been my old friend. 14, give or take the month, right? He has been my friend, meaning Cyrano, who came to be amusing. So all this time, Cyrano's the one who's come and visited me. And Cyrano says, Roxanne. And Roxanne says, it was you. No, no, Roxanne, no. And I might have known every time that I heard you speak my name. No, it was not I. It was you. I swear. I understand everything now. The letters. That was you. No, and the dear, foolish words, that was you. No, and the voice in the dark, that was you. On my honor, and the soul, that was all you. I never loved you. Yes, you loved me. No, he loved you. Even now you love me. No. And why? Why so great a no? No, no, my own dear love, I love you not. Then she goes into a little bit of a speech, says that the tears on the letter were his. You knew they were your tears. And Cyrano says the blood was his. That the 
tears and the blood of two men creating the love for Roxanne. Suddenly, Ragano and Lebray come running in saying that Cyrano is not in a physical state to be here at the convent. He's weak and he needs to be taken care of. And Cyrano says that he has not finished his gazette. He still has something to share with Roxanne. And he says that on Saturday, he adds this to his news, that on Saturday the 26th, just before dinner, Cyrano de Bergerac was murdered. He removes his hat and reveals his bandages. And he says that it's ironic that he longed to die laughing on the sword of some hero in some brave way. And here he just has this blow to the head by someone who wanted to ambush him with a log. Not a very romantic way for Cyrano, the brave Cyrano, who's so amazing, who's the poet, um, for him to go. Ragano begins to cry out. He's blubbering. Cyrano says, stop blubbering. What are you writing these days, old poet? And Ragano says he's not writing anymore, but he works for Moliere, who's another playwright. And Moliere had stolen a scene from Cyrano. And uh, Cyrano says, well, what do the audience think of it? And Ragano says they laughed and laughed. And Cyrano starts thinking and um, talking about how his role in life has been to inspire other people, for them to get the prize that they wanted. So with Moliere, he inspired him as a genius to um, write this part of the play. And with Christian, he inspired, and Christian had the good looks to go and get that kiss. Remember that balcony scene? He spends the, his life underneath the balcony not being seen and not getting that prize or that reward. He's doomed, he's doomed to always be hidden. Roxanne cries that Cyrano cannot die. And she says, she realizes that he's dying. And she says, I never loved but one man in my life. And I have lost him twice. She didn't realize that she loved Cyrano. She thought she loved Christian and she lost him. And then here she's losing Cyrano. So the same person that she loved 15, 14, 15 years ago, she now is losing again. All right, so Cyrano is dying and he becomes delirious. He starts talking about going to the moon, how he doesn't really need any spaceship or any way to get to the moon because he's going to go there when he dies. So he's kind of acting crazy and he recites this poem about his life and then he falls down into a chair. And Roxanne says, oh, my love. And she's crying. She's sobbing. And Cyrano says, not here, not lying down. And he stands up. He leans up against a trunk of a tree. He's, you know, he's dying. So he leans up against the trunk of a tree to hold himself up and he pulls out his sword. And he says that he's fighting off this skeleton of death. And how dare that skeleton of death look at his nose. And he's fighting off these imaginary enemies as he's dying. And these are the enemies of lies. He's naming them prejudice, cowardice, stupidity, and compromise. So remember... The big conflict is Cyrano's internal conflict, and these are internal conflicts. He has issues with his confidence, so he's fighting off the cowardice. So he declares that the enemies have taken almost everything from him. But in spite of that, he's going to meet God tonight, and he will carry the one thing that is unspotted from the world. One thing without stain, unspotted from the world, in spite of doom, mine own, and he springs forward with his sword. And that is when the sword escapes his hand. He totters and falls into the arms of his friend. Well, Roxanne comes over and kisses him right on the forehead. 
And she says, and that is, so what is this thing that he gets to take with him to heaven? And Cyrano opens his eyes and looks up at her and says, my white plume. And then the curtain closes on act five. So Cyrano's plume, he's worn the whole play. It represents honor, pride, bravery, and glory. So Cyrano gets to take his honor, pride, bravery, and glory with him. And that's his white plume, a symbol of honor, pride, bravery, and glory.